So good afternoon, everyone. Today will be Pantheri webinar number three, and Mr. Mirko D'Antoni will be presenting the biological process in the effluent treatment plants. Thanks again for being here today. So, okay. Hello and good morning to everyone. Thanks to joining us today. This will be the third webinar in the Pantare series of webinars. Thanks for being here. We'll start now with the presentation. And if you have any question, you can use the chat box and use it uh, also to introduce yourself. So the aim of this presentation is to discuss in details about the biological process in the affluent treatment plants. Just a brief introduction about us for anyone who is not familiar with us. We are an Italian company focus on water and wastewater treatment for textile industries, and we are basically present all around the world. We are a certified quality company, so we have quality standard certification, and this one is uh, one of our main goals to provide the top quality products and technical solution. We are part of ZDC uh, program, which has united person, partners and contributors with a common goal of guaranteeing water discharge with increasingly stringent parameters as a part of the compromise uh, with environmental sustainability. And we are proud to be part of this organization. So we have more than 90 working ETPs uh, and around 65 are located in the Southeast Asia, which is right now our main market. Okay, we are now presenting the webinar schedule. So this one is the third one about the biological process in the effluent treatment plants. Then next week, we'll, we will have the webinar regarding the ETP equipment maintenance. Uh, after that, we will talk about the zero discharge of hazardous chemicals, so roadmap to zero. Then an interesting webinar regarding the membrane bioreactors. After that, sludge treatment solution. And the last one will be uh, regarding water and brine recovery system. So let's have a look uh, to the, today's topic. First of all, we are going to define what the wastewater is and its main composition. Then we will see all the operation units within the ETPs, identify the sampling point and which analysis uh, we should carry out. After that, we are going to describe all the main biological process parameters. We will check also inside the sludge in order to have an idea of the microorganism uh, that we can find inside and outside the flocks. And at the end, we will see how to control and how to solve the possible problems we can have during the operation. So what is the wastewater? Wastewater is a water that has been used in the industrial operation, is highly contaminated, and needs to be treated properly before to discharge it in the water body. But now we know also that we can uh, treat the water using advanced filtration system and close the loop. And we will see this one uh, in the, our next um, webinars. So uh, what is the textile waste, wastewater main composition? Let's have a look. So we have color, nitrogen, phosphorus, suspended solids, TDS, BOD, and of course, COD. Everyone focus on COD, but what is the COD? It's an indicative measure of the amount of oxygen required to oxidize chemically soluble and particulate organic matter in the water. So what we normally call COD is actually the total COD. Total COD consists of soluble COD and particulate COD. Also, we have another fraction. We have soluble and biodegradable COD and we have also particulate and biodegradable COD. If we sum these two fraction, we get the biodegradable COD. At the same time, we have soluble and non-biodegradable COD and particulate and non-biodegradable COD. If we make a sum of these two, we get the non-biodegradable COD and once again, Having this one, the biodegradable CD and non-biodegradable CD, 
we get again the total CD. So pay attention when we say COD, in which fraction is actually the CD. So let me <clears throat> now introduce this guy. Uh, his name is John, he's as a textile factory, and his wastewater has a CAD of 2,000 ppm and the flow of 2,400 uh, meter cube per day. While this other guy is Frank. Frank has a sweet and cake factory, and also his wastewater has a CAD 2,000 ppm, and also the flow is 2,400 uh, meter cube per day. So you see they are very happy because they think to have the same ETP. Same CD, same flow, same ETP, easy. While well, this is me, and I say sorry, but uh, you're wrong, and why? Because it depends on your, D, on your CD characteristics, composition. Let's make an, an example. So <clears throat> John say, that my TP load is 4,800 kg per day, but also Frank say my TP load is 4,800 kg per day. So why they are wrong if they think they have the same TP? Do you remember the CD fractioning shown before? In textile effluent, 40% of CD is particulate, while 60% is soluble. So John think that his bacteria needs a lots of time to deplete the CD. Hmm? While in sweet and cake factory, 90% of the CD is soluble and only 10% is particulate. So Frank say that his bacteria needs less time to deplete CD. Yes, you're right and you got the, po the point. Now Frank, knows the characteristic and composition of its wastewater and wants you know, to know how to treat its wastewater. So how to treat? Uh, any, every one of you is familiar with this flow process. In the ATP, we have different treatment stages. Okay? We have preliminary stage, secondary stage, outlet stage, that actually is only in Bangladesh, this one, and uh, sludge stage. This one is for conventional ETP. Hmm? So preliminary treatment consists of a first screening with two millimeter uh, of space between the bars to remove the raw material and protect, of course, the other units. Then we have the pumping system, the storage tank to cope with the production fluctuation. Then the primary Clarifier is basically to remove a slit pumice, uh, pumice stone. The microfiltration that we already seen in the uh, previous uh, webinar uh, to remove cotton fluff, then chemical dosing for pH adjust, adjustment, for example, and if needed, the cooling tower to cool down the water temperature. While secondary stage, <clears throat> we can have different processes. So conventional activated sludge system, which is the oxidation tank, okay, then final sedimentation. Or we can have the membrane bioreactor or MBBR inside, which is the attached biomass inside the oxidation tank. While regarding the sludge stage, basically uh, consists of uh, the thickener and then the dewatering to get the dry matter around 20, 25% before the disposal. Of course, if we uh, make a step forward, we, we can have also advanced, advanced stage for the water recovery. So we can consider an ultra screening with a mesh of 20 microns, then ultra filtration and rubber osmosis. So now John knows the characteristic of the polluted water generated from his factory and he also know how to treat it. Yes, it's correct, but you should know how to monitor your ETP performance. And how to do that, you have to make to take a water sample and analyze it. So now John is thinking, monitoring, analyze, keep in mind this keyword, monitoring, analyze. So John have another question. Where 
you, uh, I should take the sample to carry out the laboratory analysis. This one is a good uh, question. And let's see where. So we have to consider as a sampling point, the inlet, the storage tank, oxidation tank, outlet, sludge return, and the waste sludge. Okay, so which analysis we should carry out? Look to this table in the inlet point, okay, the common parameters, CD, BOD, solids, the flow, the pH, temperature, then in the storage tank. Inside the oxidation tank, we need to know the uh, quantity of the biomass, which is inside the oxidation tank. Of, of course, also the sludge volume will by the M of cone and then calculate the SVI, the sludge volume index. Okay, the same for uh, the outlet parameter. And this one is for sludge return because it's very important also to understand the biomass composition inside the sludge return. And this one is the total solid and volatile solids in the sludge wastes. So this one is uh, good. Now, John, uh, say, <clears throat> uh, what about the frequency? So now that he knows the sampling point, how many analyses we should carry out every week, every day, or every month? And once again, regarding COD, BOD, uh, solids, MLSS, BSS, SVI, two days per week is enough. While regarding flow, pH, temperature, DO, this one every day to monitor the performance of the ETP. So now John is uh, very happy because he's now, he knows the characteristic of the polluted water, how to treat it, how to perform the laboratory analysis, and the analysis frequency. But now John has an interesting question, how he can understand if EZTP is working properly. This one is easy, evaluating the process parameters. So let's see, the main biological process parameter are the organic load, MLBSS, the F to M ratio, sludge rotation time, return activity sludge, waste activity sludge, suitability, and sludge volume index. So what is the organic load? Basically refers to the kg of BOD entering in the, uh, the process every day. Can be easily calculated having what? The flow rate in meter cube per day and the concentration of BOD. So let's call it food. Why the MLVSS? What is? Is the activated sludge? Is the bacteria? We can call it microorganism. So once we have the food and the microorganism, we can also understand what is the food versus microorganism, because it's one of the primary controls used in activated sludge plant. Is the mass of food entering the treatment plant and the mass of microorganism in the ration tank? So F2M relates to the biological state of the plant and is independent of the size of the aeration tank. Two different activators large process can have the same efficiency by operating at the same F2M ratio. Why, what is the sludge rotation time? Is the average length of time in days that an organism, the microorganism, stay in the secondary treatment system? system and represent the total mass of sludge inside the ration tank divided by the total mass of sludge wasted every day. So this parameter is also extremely important not only to uh, keep the same F2M ratio but also to keep a constant concentration of biomass inside the oxidation tank. So there is also a correlation between uh, the F2M and the SRT. So if we consider as a parameter of the sludge production, if we operate with low F2M, we have less sludge produced. And if we operate in this condition, we have high SRT. Why? Because we are wasting less sludge. 
So the connection is low F2M, ISRT, low SRT, IF2M. How to control this parameter? Regarding the F2M, we need to uh, uh, keep a desired concentration of MLBSS inside the oxidation tank. How to do that? By wasting a, a certain amount of sludge every day. And to keep the same SRT, basically it's the same the control. We need to waste the sludge if the MLS VSS is higher than the desired value. So which parameter we have to consider? Of course, the mass of uh, biomass and the kg of uh, the kilogram of BOD entering the system. While for SRT, we have to consider the mass of biomass and the mass of sludge wasted. For the sludge return, it depends, this ratio depends on the MLBSS and the RAS concentration. Usually RAS in textile process is around 1.3, 1.5 times the inlet wastewater. <clears throat> so, Return activity is large. The purpose is to maintain an accurate number of microorganisms in the aeration tank to deal with the load of entering the plant. The sludge return contains microorganisms that have the ability to deplete the organic matter in the wastewater. While the waste activity is large, is the exceeded sludge that has to be removed from the, from the system and where, where the actual amounts of solids inside the ration tank is, is higher, is greater than the desired mass of solids that we want. So regarding insectability, this one also is a, a important uh, test to carry out. Why? Because uh, using a cylinder or a heme of corn, we can understand if our biomass, our uh, sludge is able to settle down properly. We can see if we record every five minutes <clears throat> the solid liquid separation volume, we can see if our sludge is settling down very fast, very slow, or it's just right. How to understand this by the SBI? So if we know, if we know uh, the uh, concentration of biomass inside the oxidation tank, and after 30 minutes of uh, sedimentation, we get the uh, solid liquid uh, separation surface, so the ML liters here, we can calculate the SVI. Usually the SVI is in a range between 80 and 20, uh, 120, which indicates a good sitiability. If the SVI increase, the sludge is less compact, occupying more volume. So it means that the density of the sludge is uh, lower. So now John knows something more. Uh, also the most uh, important parameter which are used to run the ATP properly. And yes, this one is correct, but it's not enough because John has to know also the composition of the sludge. And how to do that? Uh, you need a microscope and see, uh, and, ma and make a microscope investigation, of course. So if we take a sample of sludge and we have a microscope, we need to study the sludge flock, the filamentous bacteria, and the microfauna that is inside the, the sludge. So what about the sludge flock? So uh, we need to check the shape, if it's rounded or irregular. The structure, if it's compact or open, the strength, if it's robust or weak, and the size, if the flock is small, medium, or large, the interaction of all these characteristics give us the type of flock. And generally, we have three types of flocks. Type one, which is rounded, not really compact, robust, and medium size. Type two is rounded, is compact, is robust, and is large. The third one is the monocolonies. 
So let's see an example regarding the shape. You can see this, uh, this picture. So this one is a rounded flock, while this one is irregular. The structure, you can see this one on the left is compact, is a good flock, while this one is open. The strength on the left, this flock is very robust, while this one is weak. And we can see this one, especially during the startup, you can see here is plenty of free living cells, which is this kind of bacteria are not inside the flock. This condition uh, occurs when filamentous bacteria are not present inside, because at the beginning, the filamentous bacteria can create a bridge between the flocks, increasing the structure of the flocks, allowing this bacteria to grow inside the flock instead of stay here in the water media. So what about the filamentous bacteria? <clears throat> they are always present in the activated sludge. In normal condition, they are not dominant. Their presence is good for the activated sludge, but pay attention, in case of proliferation, their presence is a big problem. So here I listed the uh, most common filamentous bacteria that we can find in our uh, sludge. And each bacteria, filamentous bacteria, is an indicator of a possible problem we can have. So how to identify the filamentous bacteria? We need the identification keys. So the mobility, the branching, the filament shape, the touch of growth, the filament sites, the septa, subshape, the sheath, and the location. So let's make some example. So mobility. We have these two types of filamentous bacteria. They are the only two able to move freely in the water media. Only these two guys, no other one. So Bejatoa and Flexibacter. Then the branching. We can have a true branch or a false branch. You can see in this example of Nocardia bacteria, the branching directly from the main body of the bacteria, the branch is attached. While in this one, in the Spirillunatans, you can see there is a, a space. This one is a false branch because there is a, a, a small space between the, um, the bacteria and this one, basically another one is not a branch. Why the filament shape? We can have different shape. We can find different shape in um, filamentous bacteria. So it could be linear, could be bent, and could be twisted, like a microtix parvicella. Could be like a chain, or crooked, like the drosis, or michelar. Why the touch of grow? For example, here there is no grow in this type of bacteria. But in this one, in the 0041, we can find some grow. It's few grow attached to the, uh, to the bacteria. Then lots of grow and the growth in parallel, like in this type of bacteria. Regarding the sites, okay, for this one, we need uh, another type of micro, uh, microscope. Okay, we can understand measuring the sites of the septa, of the cell, of the bacteria. We can also identify which kind of bacteria is. The septa, you can see some bacteria present the septa, someone else, no. So if we analyze in the fresh sludge, the filamentous bacteria, it's not easy to, uh, to see, to check the septa. So to do that, uh, generally, you need to uh, make a colorimetric test and understand if the bacteria is gram positive or gram negative and using also the Nesser reactive, understand if it's positive or negative. The cell shape, again here, could be round, oval, like a disc, like a barrel 
could be squared or rectangular. Why the sheath can be present or not, but also this one is an indicator that give us uh, an indication, let's say, of the type of bacteria. So why is it so important to identify the bacteria? Because each bacteria is inside the sludge for one reason. So if there is uh, low F2M, if there is low DO, if there, there is high F2M, if there is some hydraulic shock, if there is some toxic compound, this is why it's important to uh, the microscope investigation. Also, the location could be free, the flexibuckler in the water media, could be in the edge of the flock, or could be inside the flock. <clears throat> As you can see, it's very difficult to identify the filamentous bacteria, lots of identification key. So it's important to need practice every day, every day uh, with a, a benchmark book of, of filamentous bacteria, identify it and understand which one could be the possible problem in your ETP. So not only filamentous bacteria are present in the sludge, but also the microfauna. The main two families are the protozoa and metazoa. So you have seen this one everywhere. So for protozoa, we have flagellates, ameba, elizoa, and ciliates. While for metazoa, we have rotifer, nematodes, tergigrades, and worms. Let's make some, some example. You see, this one is a, an, some example of flagellates. You can see here the flagell in all of these protozoa. Also here, you have seen this one in your sludge. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, ameba and elizoa. Also, this one is one, one of the most common, that the stentor that you can find inside the, activ the activator sludge. Also, the protozoa metazoa can indicate if the, um, so the, their presence is good. Why? Because they are able to remove the free living cells. Removing the free living cells, your outlet water will be more clear. So, for example, this guy, Asp Aspidica, is one of the best. If you find this one inside your flock, you should be happy. And then also regarding protozoa, we have the ciliates. The rotifer is always present and also the worms. So the presence of the microfauna depends on the process condition. Let's see, if we operate with low F2M here and high sludge age, you remember the correlation, okay? For sure, we are going to have this kind of microorganism. And the flock is a pinpoint, is a pin flock, is a small flock. This one, especially during the startup. Okay, now John is a bit confused, but now he knows how to study the composition of the sludge and how to identify the microorganism. So yes, great John, and keep in mind that microscope investigation can help you if you are facing problem. Okay, but which kind of problem? Let, let me show to you some common process problem in the ETP. So the most common are this one, foaming, bulking, ashing, pinpoint flock, rising, and solid washout. So this chart that you can check later, okay, helps you to identify the problem depending on the visualization of your ETP. Okay, for example, you can see if you have a big quantity of floating sludge, Yes, so it's rising. If, if not, you have to check if in the foam you have filamentous bacteria. If yes, it's filamentous foaming. Otherwise, you should analyze the diluted SVI and check if it's a uh, hushing, solid washout, filament bulking, or viscous bulking. So what about the foaming? We can have four types of foam. 
you see like light brown, white, dark brown and viscous form. One of the main reasons is the air bubble trapped inside the flock. So in the microscope, you can see this one. This one is air bubbles. And if you can see a lot of this, for sure you will find foam in the surface of the clarifier or in the oxidation tank. Also, uh, surfactant like detergents or oil and grease can generate foaming, which is white and light. Also, this chart in the next one can help you to identify after the visual expression, the observation, to identify the uh, possible cause of foaming and also the remedy action that should be taken to remove the foam. Bulking. This picture, I think everyone knows this, this type of, uh, of problem. You know? When you do the imofcon or the cylinder test, then suddenly some part of the sludge settles down and then another part floats, rise up. Why? Because of these guys, the filamentous bacteria, you see? When we check the filamentous bacteria, we need to understand the filamentous index, which is from one to five. For example, this one, this index is five, which means there's a lot of filamentous bacteria. You see, we have all here the flocks and the bacteria that make the bridge between the flock. So this condition, the density of the sludge decrease and the sludge rise up. Using this chart, Again, you can have a look to, uh, after the observation to identify the, the possible cause and then a remedy action that has to be taken. This, and also in this chart. So it could be because low F, uh, F2M, ISRT, low DO, uh, some toxic compound, different reason. Okay. Well, regarding ashing, also this one is very common. On the surface of the clarifier or the clarifier, some flock stay there instead of settle down. Uh, why? Uh, these small particles float on the surface. Most of the time is due to the denitrification process inside the uh, clarifier. Uh, for example, when the factory is under production, the flow rate decreases. Hmm? So, which means the hydraulic time inside the clarifier increase. I, uh, hydraulic times can generate anoxic process inside the clarifier and the nitrification process if some nitrogen is, is there. So also low F2M can generate ashing. And again, here we, we did this one, this chart that can help you to identify the ashing and to take the necessary step. Well, regarding the pinpoint flock, uh, this one is very common when S SRT is too high and F2M is too low, due endogenous decay. And Western cell sludge can help to reestablish the right F2M ratio. And when you see this condition, especially during the startup, uh, the addition of coagulants, you see this one is the microscope picture. So if you see in the microscope, this situation, it means you have small flocks, pin, pinpoint flocks, and how to solve this problem, uh, you need to add some coagulant, like a one PPM, two PPM of polyelectrolyte directly inside of the oxidation tank. Polyelectrolyte is, cationic polyelectrolyte is able to uh, uh, increase the density of the flock, and get to the flock easier. So they're able to settle down instead to, to, to float in the surface of the clarifier. Also, this chart will give you the, uh, the procedure, the guidelines, how to solve this problem, okay? Then we are rising. Also, this one is another common problem. Um, it's similar to the, uh, the bulking, but is not the same. Uh, the main reason of the rising is a low oxygen and the nitrification process. So increasing the return sludge, so which means uh, reducing the sludge rotation time inside the clarifier can help to solve the problem. 
And also here, uh, there is the chart that give you the guideline. The last one is the solid washout. So why solids go out from the clarifier? Not pinpoint flock, not small flock, but, the, but uh, big flock, let's say, big piece, piece of sludge. Why? Uh, basically, it's because the hydraulic shock after EV rain of if the flow rate is too much of the design, the hydraulic time inside the clarifier is not enough. So the biomass is not able, sludge is not able to settle down and you have the washout. So there are some remedy, uh, could be also some uh, equipment failure, uh, also uh, uh, temperature drop or temperature difference from the surface of the clarifier and the bottom of the clarifier. So in that case, uh, some deflector uh, uh, is required. So after this uh, long presentation, uh, John has realized that uh, he could have lots of problems. Mm -hmm. But if we know, you know how to identify uh, the problem and how to take the corrective action then to mask the problem, we will solve everything. This one is correct. So keep in mind this keyword, monitoring, analyze, and decision because after that you monitor your uh, performance, analyze the samples, check in the microscope, then you have to take the decisions, corrective actions. Okay, so John is thinking to these three keywords: monitoring, analyzing, decision. You see, if you manage your ETP, you must be met. And don't worry to be met. Monitoring, analyze, and decision. So, <clears throat> final remarks, because now <clears throat> John knows what the wastewater composition, the CO fractioning, that all ETP are not the same. This one is very important. Pay attention to the CD. When we say my ETP has CD 2000, okay, but 2000 what? Give me the fraction, at least soluble and particulate. How to treat the wastewater? So within all the uh, operation units, the sampling point you have to be considering, considered in the ETP, the elaborate analysis to carry out. So the logbook has to be upgraded every week. The analysis frequency, the main process parameter, the microscope investigation, which is the, is the best indicator to understand uh, the performance of the TP, the possible process problem, and then how to take a corrective action. So how to make decisions. Once again, monitoring, analyze, and then decide. So now John is ready also to be met. So uh, let me uh, just uh, show to you this tool, uh, Pandemic, that we did is a better version, okay. But we did this tool, uh, is an Excel file, okay, uh, to uh, uh, analyze the performance of the ETP. So to make a diagnosis and take a corrective uh, action, okay. Uh, let me just show to you uh, very quickly. Here, this one is, is, uh, is the tool, okay? Is a, in Excel, is in VUBIA, is a VUBIA based. <clears throat> so you have the guideline, the several type of this function that you can find. So filament bulking, and there is the description, viscous bulking, rising sludge, everything is described with pictures and also the type of bacteria that you can find depending on the problem that you, you can have in the, during the operation, okay? Then this one is an input process parameter. So where you can put the CD, the F2M, the DO, you can change this parameter according to the analysis that you carry out, okay? Then we have this one that is the visual inspection. So in the outlet, you have just to, to uh, write here an X 
if the, if uh, is clear, transparent, of you can see some flock. This one is a visual inspection, okay? Also in the oxidation tank, in tank, in the clarifier, and in the thickener. Then after the microscope investigation, the identification of the uh, microfauna. So the total um, uh, number observed, you put three dots in the, in the glass slide and check. Mm -hmm. So, and you can see moving ciliate, how many you have seen, uh, amoeba, rotifer, you can, you can fulfill all, all of this. And the same is for the filamentous. So about this one, it's the uh, filament abundance, is the, um, uh, the index, okay, by Jenkins. From one few filamentous to six, lot of filaments, excessive. So and here all, also the, vari the different types of bacteria, so nocardia, parvicella, the different type that you can find in your sludge. Why is it very important? Because depending on the type of filamentous and microfina inside your sludge, you can have the diagnosis. So you can understand if the organic load is too low, is too high, if the O is too, o, too low or too high. And also the solid separation problem could be a rising, rising, foaming, ICD, nutrient lack, low F2M, bulk, filamentous bulking. And then at the end, you have the correct actions depending on the problem that you have in the ATP. So uh, while these other two are the benchmark of filamentous bacteria, it, you see, uh, filamentous bacteria benchmark, uh, where all the types of bacteria are described in the tiles, and when, in which condition, you can, you can see the bacteria inside the sludge. And the same here for the microfauna. Just this one can help you to identify the type of microfauna. This one is, is easier than the filamentous bacteria to identify the microfauna. Um, so, uh, thanks uh, for, uh, for listening and uh, if you have uh, any question related to the process, do not hesitate also to, uh, sorry, uh, do not hesitate to, to, to contact me. Uh, I'll give you here the details. Yes, please. And also, if you have any question, uh, we will use the chat function that is there in Zoom. And of course, for any specific questions that you may have also in the future, please feel free to contact our local agents. They will be happy to share the information with us and you will get our detailed reply from us. Okay. So, uh, okay, let's see. Okay. This one is just the contact, uh, contact our agents. And uh, now if anyone has any question, can type on the chat box. We still have five minutes to answer. Yeah. So, so yes, please uh, make sure that you are sending the chat to everyone so that everyone uh, can see the, the, the question so that all of us uh, can see it. There is Mr. Mr. Mirko D'Antoni. There is also Ms. Monica Tessarolo from our technical department as well available for you. Okay, so we get, we've got some questions. Mirko, I don't know if you have access to the chat too. Mm, yes, um, yes. From Mr. Iqbal Singh. Uh, he's asking us when filamentous is high and resulting in foaming, how can we eliminate it? So, uh, oh wait, let's, so when the filamentous, oh, okay, is I and resulting in foaming, how can we eliminate it? So basically it depends on the type of filamentous. This is why the microscope investigation is extremely important. Uh, usually uh, why filamentous grow, a uh, lot of filamentous grow, uh, depends on process conditions. So it could be extremely low F to M, uh, so, which means high retention, uh, sludge retention time uh, could be also uh, because low DO uh, and some toxic compound. But generally, if the condition is low F2M and high 
um, uh, sludge rotation time, you should waste some sludge. Then also uh, to remove uh, quickly filamentous bacteria, you should dose uh, hypochlorite in the return sludge to kill the filamentous bacteria. Do not exceed with the dose because otherwise you are going to kill also the other bacteria, the good bacteria. Okay, so thank you, Mirka. So we've got a couple of questions here about the template. Is it available for plant operators? Well, actually this information, this whole webinar will be made available in uh, some days in our website. So just like uh, for our past uh, webinars, you will be able to find this information in our website www.pantherywater.com. It will be available for you there so you can so that you can see not only the presentation but also all the audio and all the all the webinar there. And uh, what if the BOD and nitrogen uh, proportion is higher than uh, five? I mean, if you have more nitrogen, more than more than five, if you have excess nitrogen, of course, depending on the total nitrogen, we will um, we would analyze it and we will check whether you need a denitrification section. Mm -hmm. um, so, Mirko, if you want to go on with uh, Mr. Ravinder, I think is the next question. Uh, Let me yes. see. Uh, Mr. Robin, Mr. Robin, there, D man is asking us if the COD is high, like 35,000 milligrams mm -hmm. per liter or PPM, and TDS is yeah. 500. What is mm -hmm. the treatment of recommended? Yes, okay. Uh, basically, uh, first of all, my question will be which type of uh, production can produce this type of, uh, of COD? Okay, uh, it depends. It depends. Uh, you can have a uh, different type of treatment. Okay, with this kind of CD, for example, if, uh, if it came out from tannery house, from uh, sweet and cake, or something like that, from sugar mills, uh, you can use anaerobic treatment first to reduce at least 60% this, uh, this load. Uh, and then the uh, oxidation tank, okay, aeration. <clears throat> so it's a, a combination of uh, biological process. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, I mean, anaerobic treatment is okay if you have a lot of uh, soluble CD and volatile suspended solids in the effluent. Otherwise, it's useless. Uh, otherwise, you can use a chemical uh, physical separation uh, to take out uh, from 50 to 70% of the CD, and the rest you can, you can treat by the aerobic. Yes, and of course, one very important thing always to have the BOD and COD ratio in order to determine the biodegradability of the effluent. So it's always good to have the COD and the BOD so that we can make this proportion. Exactly. So we have here another question that uh, would you please share the function of oil and grease removal? Uh, actually, uh, oil and grease uh, depends on the uh, equipment you can have there. Not only can cause some problem regarding foaming, for example, the type 3 of foam, you remember that one that uh, it seems like viscous foam. Uh, also, uh, if the oil attached in the, in, the, in the sludge is hydrophilic, which means uh, that repels, uh, that uh, erase the, the, the water. So there is not a good contact between the bacteria and the, the flock and the um, organic matter. Uh, so this is why uh, if oil and grease exceed a certain concentration in the inlet, it will be better at uh, oil, uh, on the oil uh, and grease separation at the beginning as a primary treatment. This one can happen when, for example, uh, in the factory, uh, the waste of the chicken is, is uh, the kitchen is there. Uh, let me mean, all the grease from wash, washing the dishes and then something like that. Uh, also, some oils uh, could happen that during the maintenance, uh, if you change the oil of the equipment, could happen. I don't know that the oil can go in the in the ETP. So, if the concentration is too high, it's better to remove it by uh, grease separation separator. Otherwise, otherwise could be a problem, a foaming problem. So, there is the next question about the extended aeration process on SRT six to ten days. Okay, no. Why? Because uh, extended aeration. Uh, means that the F2M ratio is below 0 0.1. Uh, 
uh, usually it's 0 0.6, 0 0.7, or 0 0.8. If you operate with the low F2M, you have high sludge rotation time. Could not be six to 10 days. This kind of SRT, you will find, you, you can have this kind of SRT for sewage uh, treatment. And when the F2M ratio is medium or high, uh, which means more than 0 0.3, um, and then extended duration, what is used? Because uh, with extended duration, so having an SRT that is around 40, 45 days, the um, organic matter and everything is almost mineralized. So it means you don't need the sludge treatment, biological sludge treatment to mineralize the, uh, the biomass wasted. So this is why also in extended duration, you will have a uh, higher concentration of biomass. You will have, of course, uh, a higher amount of oxygen required, but the less sludge production. So thank you. And there is uh, another question here um, about the, uh, in case of sludge washout, the increase of the return activated sludge or, or uh, waste activated sludge, which control is good? <clears throat> okay, actually the uh, sludge washout depends on the hydraulic shock. So an EV rain or um, let's say if the um, inlet in the ATP is higher than the side, let's see two times, three times higher than the sign. The secondary clarifier is the, is the sign as per the design flow without any peak, why? Because there is the storage tank uh, that coupled with the fluctuation. But in case of every rain, for example, uh, actually there is, uh, let's say, no nothing to do, but okay, you can increase uh, the RAS you can increase the RAS in order to try to reduce the HRT inside the, oxy the, the clarifier. Okay, so um, there is another question about how to calculate the sludge production per kg removed of VOD. Well, this, uh, of course, uh, Mirko will also agree, it depends also in the type of effluent. And uh, we can give you maybe a rough estimation. It can be, I don't know, we can tell you around 0 0.2 kg. Mm -hmm. of a uh, sludge produced per kg of BOD removed, yes, roughly exactly. speaking. But this will be, of course, a sludge at 100% dry matter concentration. So it will depend afterwards in the type of sludge treatment. Uh, and according to that concentration, we will know exactly how many kg of final sludge you will get. Exactly. And basically, uh, also, just let me add something about this so because it's an interesting question. Uh, so if you know the volume of your um, uh, oxidation tank and you know the concentration, you can calculate the uh, kilogram, okay? The kg of, uh, uh, of MLSS, uh, VSS inside the oxidation. This one is the, uh, the mass of sludge inside the VSS. Then if you operate by a combination of parameters, let's see, if you keep an SRT constant, okay, then, then uh, using a formula, okay, simple formula, you can calculate the uh, wasted sludge. In that case, uh, you, uh, under operation, you know how is the kg remover, uh, the sludge production per kg removed uh, of BOD. Otherwise, as Manuel said, you have to use the, the yield uh, which means is a kinetic constant that could be zero two or zero three, but is a rough uh, parameter. That's Actually, yeah, yeah. This is a very interesting question also because um, we'll be hosting another webinar specifically for sludge treatment. So this is very good. It will be held later on, uh, and there you will be able to see the technologies for a sludge treatment and any other information regarding the sludge uh, part, the sludge section. And that webinar will be held on June 4th. So you can save the date and we will get very specific on sludge on that date. Okay, so now uh, we have again from uh, Nazia another interesting question that is uh, waste sludge and recirculation are different in MBBR process. 
So actually, in, um, the type of process is different, okay? Because in conventional treatment, the biomass is suspended. And to keep a certain concentration, you need uh, to have uh, a recycled sludge, return sludge, okay? So you have a, a different uh, time, time parameter. One is the hydraulic time, the other is the sludge re uh, retention time. While in MBR, strictly MBBR, sorry, uh, the biomass is attached, okay, in the plastic media. And you don't need any uh, sludge return. Uh, so, which means that you do not need to uh, calculate the F2M ratio. You don't need to calculate the SRT because are not, are not present in the, in the process. While if using the MBBR, you recirculate some sludge, then the process is different. It's called the IFSA. It's an hybrid system where inside the oxidation tank, you have both attached and suspended biomass. So um, there is also another question about the sludge washout. In case of sludge, sludge washout, in order to increase in the increase of the return activity sludge or waste activated sludge control, which one is better, which one is good? Yeah, yes, of course. Uh, the step point analysis could be could be, a, um, let's say, a, a good a good analysis to to carry out uh, to understand uh, in which part of the of the of the graph of the curve of the solids curve you uh, you are in, in in that moment. But uh, the, for the solid washout, for the uh, sludge washout, uh, since it depends on hydraulic shock. Uh, so just open at the maximum the RAS and then just wait that the evil rain stop or the uh, or at least try to reduce if it depends on an over hydraulic load uh, from the um, inlet try to use as better as possible uh, the storage tank and reduce the uh, water flow. Okay, so I think that was the last question we had for the moment. As we said before, in case you need any further information or specific information for your ETP, our local agents will be glad to get the request from you and they will send it to us so that we can send you a detailed reply. So if there are no other further questions, um, we really hope to see you again next week, May 14 at 11 a.m. Italian time, which is 2.30 p.m. Indian time, 3 p.m. Pakistan, 4 p.m. Bangladesh, sorry, 3 p.m. Um, uh, Bangladesh and 4 p.m. Uh, Indonesia Western time. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Uh, so thank you to everyone again and see you next week. Thanks again. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. All the Pantheroy staff, thanks you. Have a nice weekend. Bye everyone and thanks bye again. Bye-bye, thanks. <laughs>